because ultimately the immigration system is divisive and discriminative, as, as Graeme have mentioned. I want to also touch on some of the things that our members have been sharing with us and some of the recent experience we had. Um, on Sunday, um, as, you, as Graeme mentioned, the dispersal process of people seeking asylum is now being placed in hotel accommodations across the country. And there has been a new hotel being used in Erskine. I'm not sure if you have seen what happened, but unfortunately, the local community in Erskine, uh, together with a racist, and I would call it fascist group, who called a protest to say that um, people in, the, uh, in Erskine who placed in the hotels are not welcome here. And unfortunately, on Sunday, I was present um, there and I felt the hatred in, in the people when they were shouting openly racist um, words and openly racist um, things towards the people who, who were placed in the, in the hotels. So my question would be, why is this happening and what can we do to prevent this? What, what is the Scottish Government doing to prevent this? Because there is a lot of misinformation being shared in the local communities and when you place a group of vulnerable people in, in these areas where there is already ongoing issues such as, you know, there's austerity, there's poverty that's happening. However, it's, it's easier to blame, as we all know, to when, when there is an outsider, let's call it, somebody who gets moved into the area. And the hostility that was experienced day, the, there and the hatred, I literally felt it. And that was something that made me really uncomfortable in, in Scotland, where I have been here for 21 years. And I was questioning of how do we welcome people? How do we integrate people when they are met with hostility rather than hospitality? And this is a question I'm asking because I am, we are worried about the safety and well-being of the people who are now uh, placed in Erskine Hotel. And it's not just Erskine Hotel, it's the other hotels across the country in Scotland and across UK as well. And how are we ensuring that people in the local communities know the facts about why people are being placed in hotel accommodations. And as Graham mentioned as well, this, this is a practice we are hugely concerned because it is not welcoming people. When people are not placed in um, normal accommodations in, in our communities, this is creating the, the notion of us and them. And ultimately, it's going to lead to a lot of um, racism and hatred incidents um, in our communities. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thanks for that, Pinar. Um, the pictures on the telly were absolutely horrific, and I think um, if we ever, if anybody ever pretends that racism is not a problem in Scotland, then we saw it on our on our TV screens. It was absolutely horrific. So I think you're absolutely right to raise that as a, a question for us to think: How can we tackle that to make sure that people do feel as welcome as I think all politicians want people to feel welcome? But you know, that there was the experience that we we saw on the telly. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Pinar, first of all, obviously, I am going to go back to the fact um, uh, I've seen it on television and I wasn't even there and it was absolutely terrifying to watch some of the words out of people's mouths. And that's in Scotland, it's happening, right? I was born here and if that was to happen to me or anybody else that I see around, I think it's absolutely disgusting. So my question is about around hate crime. So basically looking at the recent hate crime statistics, they reveal that racism is the most commonly reported as hate crime. And yet there's a lack of data collection on race, particularly in criminal justice. Why do you think that is? And what effect, if any, do you think it is having on the ability to tackle racism related to, to hate crime? Um, I think this, this has been an issue for a long time. And I remember when there was a consultation done a few years ago regarding why there's a law uh, taken reporting any sort of hate crime. I think. There is a lack of trust in, in the system that when people make uh, any form of uh, reporting for hate crime, what happens? Does it does it get followed up? Um, when I report something, does that mean it's going to be solved? So these are some of the things that we hear from the community. We try to also raise awareness about how to report a hate crime. I think that's another thing that needs to be addressed. A lot of people don't know, um, unless it's a place of third, uh, set, third place reporting centre, or some people report on behalf of you. Unless people know that, um, there, there's a huge, um, unfortunately, data gap in there. Also, another thing which Green would agree is, a lot of the people, when they flee from persecution if, to seek asylum and refuge, there is, they are fleeing from some form of 
of authority. So to trust authority, I think that that's an area that needs to be discussed as well, to say that if whether, whether we would get the help um, from the police if we make any sort of um, any sort of yeah um, hate crime um, uh, reporting. Um, I think this is some of the biggest issues, and um, we did have one incident um, where we were during the Zoom uh, when in, in the pandemic, where we literally had a person having a, a stone thrown to his window while we were having our meeting, and we tried to help this person to make a report to say, you know, this shouldn't be happening, and then nothing had um, took place, and there was no action to follow this. And that person said, you know, I don't want to follow this up anymore. This is already stressing me. I'm already in the asylum process. Um, the, the impact on my well-being, on, on my mental health is huge. And to deal with such a thing without any advocacy and without any support is, is a huge concern for people. Um, so these are some of the areas that maybe I have to add, but I don't know if anyone else um, wants to add anything yeah. Um, there's a lot of underreporting within ethnic minority communities. Um, and I think coupled with the hostile home office policies, um, it's amazing about the amount of women that we are supporting that will see things on TV that think it's actually already became policy. Um, and I could go back to an example that we were supporting some women who had experienced a crime um, and they were refugees um, and we were supporting them. We said, look, you know, this is a hate crime. We can help you report it. However, some of them were undocumented. So they felt like if they were to report a hate crime and I think that's going to be a real issue when we're looking at hate crime from now on if there are going to be a lot of refugee asylum seekers or people who are undocumented who are going to be experiencing the hate crime they're going to be experiencing it and they're going to walk away because they don't want to be speaking to authorities and we also know that there might also be an obligation within police to actually let home office know who is undocumented who is do undocumented so I think that's definitely going to create a bigger impact on the hate crime figures. Um, like I said, as much as I tried my best to support this woman, they were just like, absolutely not, we're not interested. Uh, to Miriam, that it's, it's not only refugees. I think even people who are born and brought up and, and raised in this country will often not um, raise an issue of racism. A recent example was my niece, who, as I say, is born and brought working, adult working um, in a pharmacy who experienced racism and her boss was telling her to report it and she was like, there's just no point. I think for so many years, so many of us, have, and, and I mean, talk about myself in that as well, experience racism on an everyday, and it's not even a daily basis, it can be an hourly basis. Um, so everywhere and anywhere you go, there is racism there. Um, I think we have very much learned how to block it out and walk past it. And it's become a learned behaviour that you just ignore it and you carry on. And, and that is the reality. So it's not even about refugees or mig migrants who are, it's, it's, it's British citizens born here, raised here, um, who are experiencing this. And it's, it's as I say, we're just blocking it out so much um, every day. And I think very often it is about people thinking, and, and like, like my niece's uh, instance, she was thinking, I thought, I, I'm so busy at work, I've got so much on, I don't have the time to go and, and report this or the energy to go and report this, because if I'm reporting it, I'll have the police here every single day. I think people don't understand the extent of racism, really don't understand the extent of racism. It's, it's in our lives, it's in our faces every day. Um, and I don't see how that changes quickly. I think it's, it's a, a long, long process, but um, yeah. It's, sorry, um, go back to that, Praveen, what you've just said. I mean, having racism, right, every single hour. I mean, I know I've spoken to people, I come from an Asian background, it's there and sometimes people do ignore it. But what can we do? We're parliamentarians here and obviously this is a committee um, and obviously the Scottish Government will be listening as well, you know. Mm -hmm. What can we do more to stop this and how can we build that trust that you... That, people, whether they're from refugees or, you know, seeking asylum, or whether they're people that are born here, mm -hmm. that the trust is built with the criminal justice system and with the Scottish Government so that people can come to us and speak to us about this? Because certainly it's not acceptable in the 21st yeah. century. It shouldn't Absolutely. be. I, I think it's about, it, it's about the situation Pinar uh, raised where she felt uncomfortable. But there must have been other people around about that felt uncomfortable. And it's about, it doesn't have to be the black face that reports it. 
-hmm. you as 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 mainstream uh, you know the mainstream can be uh, white people can be reporting it and i think the more we see that happening and the only reason she, my, my niece actually did end up reporting it was her white boss was like no you need to report this you need to report this and he kept going and, and he messaged her and phoned her and said have you done it have you done it and then she did report it but i think we have been so kind of suppressed in a, in a sense that we do need the white community stands to start standing up and saying hey that's not right mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and calling calling colleagues out because it, it's happening in professional environments and it's about calling colleague, colleagues out and saying hang on a minute and everybody's starting to take a stance against it and i think that then gives us the confidence to say yeah actually you're right mm -hmm. uh, because at the moment i think a lot of people a lot of the time feel they are a problem if they're raising it so if I, if, I, if I had an incident against me, it's like, I'm just going to be another problem for someone. Mm -hmm. So we need, we need to be raising it as, as a whole nation rather than asking the black people to raise it. That, that's good. F F yeah. um, I'm interested in, and actually we've just heard a bit from, from Parveen around relationships and the importance of relationship, um, a, a, a relational approach. I worry that race relations, which kind of takes me back to when we started discussing things around the Equality Act in 2010. It feels like quite an old statement to make, but I'm worried like, that race relations and what you're saying um, could be getting worse. And I, I, I noted Pinar's um, comments on people being placed in hotels rather than ordinary community situations. Um, I've, been, I've got a couple of questions about it. I've been worried about what that means, particularly in Glasgow. Um, but also for, for the people who are who are now currently on MS Ambition, um, I'm worried about where they're going to go when when that when that closes and at the end of March. Um, and have you have you noticed any impact on race relations in the city and across Scotland as a result of the the more hostile environment, but also um, of the way that we've been putting people into sort of unusual accommodation circumstances, as we might call it. Um, thank you for that. Um, yeah. So, because we work with welcoming people and we work with people directly, and we have a lot of services that we provide, as as Parveen mentioned, in terms of ESO classes and um, other um, areas as well, it has a huge impact of making someone feel welcome, mm. and it has a huge impact of someone to be part of a community. When people are placed in rural areas, especially on hotels, mm. um, and as earlier <clears throat> Graham mentioned, there's a huge profit being made by the hotels, uh, and we need to highlight that, and I think we cannot hide from that. Um, the hotels that are being used are usually isolated from community and are in uh, areas that's hard to reach. And when somebody is given £9.30 uh, pence a week, how do we expect them to travel to colleges? How do we expect them to travel to communities? How do we expect them to go and see their lawyers? So they are actually disconnected from society and placed in a um, detention-like condition. Um, and one of the horrifying things on... <clears throat> In, on Sunday in Erskine was um, I had a brief chat with the mayor's officer uh, on the day and the way that he spoke was saying we're going to flourish this area in six, seven months. So for me that means there's a clear um, indication that they actually want to keep the people in hotel accommodations longer than um, weak spaces and they want to keep people in there and create a hostile environment where they are disconnected from society and where they are actually creating uh, programs of activities in the hotels and there's a huge worry for people's safety as I mentioned um, if there's misinformation being highlighted in the news if there are groups uh, mentioning that um, these people are not welcome. Who's going to protect the people in the hotel accommodations? What if something happens, is my question. We have seen what happened in Park Inn incident in 2020. A life was lost and it was the first time that a person was killed in Scotland by Police Scotland um, in, in a knife crime incident. And what if something happens? Who's going to be responsible for these actions? And we have been highlighting this since 2020. 
And unfortunately, as uh, so one of the things that Pam also mentioned is people are going to be disconnected from uh, society. And this is where we're going to see the racist and discriminative uh, immigration system being implemented in Scotland. It's going to be us and them where we fear the other people who are actually seeking asylum and refuge. And I think in Scotland, we can do something differently where we condemn. I have not seen anything from the Scottish government uh, after Sandy's incident. Um, condemning the actions and condemning that Scotland is a welcome, uh, saying that Scotland is a welcoming country and that we condemn any form of racism. I have not seen this any form platform and I think condemning and challenging these misinformation is a, something that we can do in, in Scotland and preparing the communities I think is so important. Placing people in rural areas and areas which is already deprived and has ongoing concerns and if you place a group of people obviously the community is going to blame and point the finger there and we have seen this history repeating itself I think preparing the communities if this practice is going to continue is a huge um, is a huge um, work that needs to be done and it could be done where we create maybe community cafes where we create community conversations and this could be led by the local councillors uh, and the local authorities uh, where the local community is being um, informed uh, and the fourth is the far right and extremists like you know patriotic alternative have exploited what's happened here and done what they do across the UK and this comes from this Home Office practice but as Pinar said it does definitely need a coherent public national response from Scotland on it including from the Scottish Government uh, that's really important as part of the anti-racist approach that anyone should take. Uh, and the final thing was just to say that, as Pinar said, look, you know, Helena Kennedy, Baroness Helena Kennedy, KC, you know, conducted the inquiry on behalf of Refugees for Justice. Pinar would speak better about it than I. Uh, that was a document that was published last November. I've never been at a more dignified and more powerful launch event in my life in 20 years working in human rights work and it was because it was led by the people who were actually affected directly by it and you could see the cohesion there. Uh, as far as I'm aware there's not, still not been a response from the relevant parties to that report. That is a vital learning document to what Pinar and others are describing around what happens when you have this institutionalising, commercialising approach to people who come here seeking safety and place them into these ex-hotel regimes? You know, we Maggie's first question, what can we do? Yeah. Well then, we read that document, respond to that document and implement as much of those recommendations within devolved competence. I understand Refugees for Justice are, are still seeking the meeting with the First Minister and we really hope that happens because we know the First Minister cares about these issues deeply as well and we think that would be a really constructive way forward. Um, so in terms of what we can do, that would be the next one is to actually meet Refugees for Justice with Baroness Helena Kennedy and the First Minister so we can take that work forward together, that learning together about what can be done because that Home Office practice is getting rolled out systemically as I described earlier on across the UK and it's going to create all these very harmful impacts and it's also perversely creating opportunities for far-right extremists and that will create more unsafe conditions for all visible ethnic minorities within a UK context because if far-right extremists feel they've got the oxygen of publicity and they've got the oxygen of, 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 of the opportunities to exploit then they will exploit those opportunities as we're tragically seeing eh, most recently. There was a a news article about a family who was displaced from a hotel because and they lived there permanently and a refugee family was moved in. I think that type of PR is not helpful because it, it, stuff in the, in the public because it's basically saying local people are being displaced and it's again creating a them and us kind of attitude. And I wondered what the thinking behind doing that had been at the time. It's clearly about the economy and trying to um, the people uh, income for for um, certain communities, and it just makes me think that in terms of when policies are being developed, there really needs to be a race focus on them, and it needs to be very very early. So I'm thinking that a lot of the 
the use of hotels in kind of remote areas is about let's build the economy of those remote areas, but there's not race has not been part of the assessment of what happens when we do this in terms of racism. So that really needs to be brought to the table at a very early stage, rather than at the end when things start going wrong or kind of you know okay we've finished doing what we're doing, but oh let's look at it with a race element. The race needs to be at there as part of the assessment process right at the beginning of any policy, whether it's about economy or or anything. Um, so it is. Yeah, just to highlight that, um, really appreciate the committee listening to our concerns, and I think it's important that we see some form of a statement um, from the Scottish Government condemning such um, racist incidents and actions, and to say that I think in Scotland we could do things differently. And I would set an example if we looked at some of the campaigns that's led by the people, especially looking at the concessionary travel, mm -hmm. um, and to see if we could make this workable, and also looking at um, ways of um, raising awareness in the communities that the, the usage of where the hotel is being used um, and I think these are the areas that we can definitely evidently do do in Scotland so that um, we don't see any form of um, divisive um, actions and racist, racism um, in the communities and I think these needs to be highlighted now it's really important um, and on in Erskine on Sunday what was really sad to see was part of the community in Erskine was uh, and divided on both sides and I'm thinking for long term for the community in there how is that going to impact them as a community for the long term of um, the the people itself in there uh, discussing about uh, migration and I think this needs to be considered very seriously of where we are placing people the impact it has on that community the, imp the impact it has on the people and what sort of an image we will be creating in Scotland.